Hey everybody, welcome back to another Home with Olympus Live. Uh, we are changing gears a little bit again this week. We're gonna talk about a different topic than last week, which is always great. I'm gonna do my normal housekeeping, but first I wanna preface my normal housekeeping with uh, a little bit of news. We're gonna take a break from Home with Olympus next month for the month of August, but have no fear because on August 19th, we are going to be celebrating World Photography Day. And during that time, we are gonna have speakers from morning to night on our channels, both our YouTube and our Facebook channels from all over the globe. So we will have people from Germany, the UK, Australia, America, Canada. We love you Canadians. Uh, we're gonna have people all day long giving um, seminars and presentations on August 19th. Uh, so definitely make sure that you check your calendar, circle it, put Olympus Day on there so you can come hang out with us uh, and spend the day learning about photography. Um, so tonight we have a special guest, Olympus educator Lee Hoy is going to be joining us in just a moment. Uh, yes, I'm answering you up front, everyone. We are recording these sessions just like we always do. So you can definitely check back in at a later time if you missed the first half or if you just want to rewatch it because you were super interested in what we learned. Definitely check it out on both our Facebook page and our YouTube page. As soon as the, um, the live session is done, there will be a recording available. Um, we also will hold all of our questions for Lee until the end of the presentation, and then we will do the Q&A live and have him answer on screen. So if you have some really awesome questions you really want to know the answers to, make sure you save those towards the end and start hitting me up at the very end, and I'll pop them on the screen for you. Uh, I think that's it for the do's and the don'ts. Uh, let's get Lee on. Should we introduce Lee here? Let's see. How's it going, Lee? Hey, I'm doing great. How are y'all doing this evening? Good. We've got people from everywhere joining I us see tonight. That. I, I'm feeling for all of my Californian friends on there because it is hot. Somebody said they're in hot San Diego, and I'm also very hot. Where are you at, Lee? It's a miserable 75, 76 degrees here in the mountains of West Texas. I'm suffering. I don't have air conditioning, and as you can see, I'm just drenched in. Actually, it's been incredible. Yesterday was in the 60s much of the day, rain. Uh, people don't realize I live at 6,431 feet up in the mountains of West Texas. So it's not the same as when people think of most Texas. When you think of West Texas, everybody thinks flat and boring. Well, I'm sitting out here looking directly at a McDonald Observatory, so it's anything but boring out here. Yeah. And nice and secluded, right? You live kind of in a quiet neighborhood, right? <laughs> Very. In fact, I warned her earlier that if you guys hear a dog bark, it's my bulldog. And it's either been triggered by javelina, it's been triggered by deer, or perhaps some feral donkey. So if you hear the dog bark, it means he's warning me about impending danger. We also have owl dad, which is another introduced species sometimes out in the yard. So 102, Michael. I'm glad I'm not where you're at. <laughs> right. Uh, it's a, I'm, it's it's about a hundred here today in my oh. studio. As everyone knows, does not have AC. I'm gonna start an AC my studio oh. GoFundMe. I swear. It's <laughs> awful. Oh, so it's it's always sweaty in here. So I'm jealous of oh. your 70 degree weather. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah, it's nice. It's very Somebody nice. said that West Texas is a lovely place to live. So uh, they're in North spot, Texas. Lee. So yeah, yeah, <laughs> they're hot and sweaty right now. I guarantee yeah. it. Oh, we've got somebody from Brazil. Hello. Look at that. Hey, I yeah. saw Norway, Aussies. I mean, yeah. I saw all people from all over. It's awesome. Yeah. I know we always get the Australians. Good morning, Australia. It's, it, I believe it's morning there. I, I I've figured out so. almost yeah. all the yeah. time zones, I think. But they're still <laughs> having a beer, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> so, all Cheers, right. Mate. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so what are we going to talk about tonight? What are you what are you what are you planning on? So one of the things I really thought about was have you ever like had someone come back from vacation and they're all excited to share you all their photos? And when I mean all their photos, I mean from the beginning of the memory card to the end. And you think, <laughs> my gosh, there wasn't a single good image in that whole stretch of images. So what I want to do tonight is talk to you about how to take vacation photos that are worth sharing that people other than your grandma would really appreciate it. Cause grandma is going to lie to you and go, Oh, that's lovely, dear. Well, I'm the kind of guy who goes, Oh, that's terrible. 
Yeah, you would too. <laughs> but <laughs> the reality is it's not that hard to take your vacation photos to the next level where when you have something to share with people, they suddenly step back and go, oh, wow, that's a really cool image. And the tips I'm going to give you tonight, regardless of whatever Olympus gear you have, you can do it. Regardless of your level in terms of photography or even post-processing, you can do it. So I'm giving these tips and these techniques and tricks thinking about someone who's maybe just got their first Olympus camera. Like yours don't look like all beat up and crappy. Like mine are scratched. I, I lay in the dirt. I work mine hard. <laughs> so yours probably is still nice and black and shiny. <laughs> I wish mine was still nice and black. Yes, yeah, I, I have I the same thing. I'm very <laughs> aggressive with my photography. I'm always like climbing trees with my camera. Or That's it. I had it on my That's kayak it. this weekend and my husband had a freak out. He was like, <laughs> what if you drop it in the lake? And I'm like, ah, it's an Olympus. It's fine. It's probably not. That's, fun, right. That's right. <laughs> Jennifer can tell you. I'll be like, she has so many emails for me. Hey, Jennifer, I broke this lens. I got to send it in. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm like dropping them on rocks. I mean, I I use this gear so hard and it handles me so well another thing i love about it yeah well i'm gonna get out of your way and you know okay. turn my uh fan up higher because uh, <laughs> it's hot and let you get your presentation going so let me go ahead and bring that, that up for you great. and i just saw somebody say they were here from moscow too so i see that yeah i couldn't pronounce her name <laughs> that's awesome yes oh and the uk representing hello and, oh, yes. and somebody hello. from Look australia Somebody from Very Australia cool. said good morning and that they will wait for their beer. So you were wrong. Oh, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's well, awesome. I'm going to head out of here. Thank you again. One more reminder. We are recording these sessions. Don't worry. You can watch it later. And two, we will do a Q&A session at the end of Lee's slides. So I'll see you in a little bit for Q&A. Have fun, Lee. All right. Thank you, ma'am. All right, guys. First, I want to start out with telling you how much I appreciate your time. As someone who has done a lot of these webinars, I never take for granted that you're choosing to invest your time, perhaps your resources, your money into learning from us. So thank you for trusting me with your time this evening. I hope at the end that you said, wow, that was really a lot of fun. And that I learned some great tips and techniques for my photography. I am owner and guide of Big Bend Birding and Photo Tours. I live near Big Bend National Park in West Texas. And for a part of what I love to do, is to help people experience Big Bend National Park out here in West Texas. Been exploring it for 30 years. I love wildlife, landscape, night sky, macro, high speed, camera trap photography. I enjoy it all. I've even gotten into street photography some, which is you'll see some of my examples in this presentation. But if you ever want to come out to Big Bend National Park in West Texas, do some great night sky or do some wildlife and whatnot, look me up. I'm also very proud to share that I do a lot of international and domestic workshops. I'll share some of those with you at the end as well for wild side nature tours. And I'm looking forward to, in September 2nd, I leave for Alaska, uh, do an inner passage workshop with like four clients on that. And then I'm going to go to the Galapagos and then do Ecuador high speed hummingbird returning home on October 9th. So I'm looking forward to that little tour and uh, travel right there. I'm extremely proud to be called an Olympus educator. Uh, they invited me to be an educator after using the gear for a year, which said a lot to me uh, about how much they enjoyed my work and my presentations and whatnot. So very honored to represent Olympus. And I am so ecstatic that I started using their gear. And I'll be telling you some of the reasons why as we go through this. So where do I live? Home is where the Milky Way is. On the left is a view just off to the west on my front porch. You can see my little mountain home here with the Milky Way behind it in September. I'm sitting behind one of those sliding glass doors right now. So I am very fortunate to live in one of the darkest night skies in the lower 48 of the U.S. And having said that, let's jump right into how to take these vacation photos that are worth sharing. And I'm going to go through 10 different tips for you. And right now I'm going to give you a brief introduction to each of them. We're going to talk about angles and how angles can take your photography to the next level. Clouds are your best friend. Trust me on this one. We're going to talk about chasing light. How to choose the right lens for your image. You know, there, there's a lot of times that uh, an image would have been a lot better if it had perhaps a better choice of lens for that particular moment. I want to teach you about how to be patient and why you should be patient. We're going to talk about taking your camera everywhere you go. Following your eye. 
composition. How do we use our own eye to teach us about composition? And then I'm going to talk about getting off the beaten path, even how to do it when you're on the beaten path. And there's a way to do that. And then we're going to talk about capturing candid moments, how to look for those moments that are truly candid because they're much more powerful. And then finally, let the details tell the story. Sometimes we, we, we need details to help tell the story of our trip. So having, having introduced you to them, let's jump into the first one, okay? So tip number one is angles. And what I mean by angles is look for interesting angles. One of the ways that your vacation images sometimes can be boring is when you take an image at a level or a direction or an angle that the eye already expects. I call one of the worst things to happen to photography the iPhone pose. That's this, right? You're standing up, your camera's at eye level, and you take a picture. Unless you have some momentous light, some unbelievable occurrence in front of you, odds are that's going to be somewhat boring because it's what the eye expects. For example, you see this image of a buffalo here in Yellowstone in winter. I'm kneeling down behind a log across the river so that I am actually shooting from the head angle of the buffalo, making the image seem much larger. Had I been shooting down, standing up, wouldn't have been nearly as interesting an image. Uh, I was just in Taos. I was so lucky. Oh my gosh. Uh, Olympus sent me the new 8 to 25 millimeter lens to test. And I have a confession to make to you. When they first sent it to me, I said, man, I have the 7 to 14. I have the 12 to 40. 8 to 25 F4, it's a little slower, but it did use a screw-in lens, a screw-in filter instead of uh, like 7 to 14 where you got to buy a special adapter. They sent it to me before I went on this trip with my wife to Taos, and let me just say, I ordered it the first day I could. It will be in my bag, and it will be in my bag everywhere I go. I love this new lens. It is spectacular. And here's an example. Uh, I I hired a professional photographer, even though I am one, to teach my wife. My wife said she wanted to get back into photography. I don't know if she just likes buying gear or if she really likes taking pictures. But either way, I called this photographer and I said, listen, here's why I'm hiring you. I'm a professional. But I want you to teach my wife so that we don't fight and we can have a great vacation. That'll be a wonderful thing. You take her. I'm going to go take shots. Worked out beautifully. Marriage tip number one. This is a free. This is special. This is extra. Hire a photographer for either spouse that needs it so that you, the photographer, can then have a good time. But this is at uh, St. Uh, Francis of Sissy. This is a very famous church right outside of Taos. And you will see a ton of images of this statue of uh, St. Uh, Sissy here uh, holding the bird with the cross. But where most of them are taken to eye level, I had a spectacular sky above me. So I knelt down and shot straight up into the sky. And that really gave me a really nice perspective. It made this statue just seem giant. And I put this beautiful cloud by this in sky behind it, converted to black and white, so that really you, you really see how he's looking down at this little bird, as opposed to the image we see over and over and over again of this statue from his eye level and your eye level. So again, kneeling down, shooting up, and using that 8 to 25, oh my gosh, it should be here any day. I can't wait. Now, I, as I said, I'm getting ready to go to the Galapagos. I, I, I've been to the Galapagos before. And here is this gorgeous little Galapagos sea lion pup. And he was he was crying for his mom. She was probably out fishing. And I immediately dropped down and laid down on the sand. Oh, I heard some. If you heard that thunder, that means uh, if we see lightning, I might have to pause to go shoot, okay? We get some spectacular thunderstorms up here on the mountain. But by laying down on the sand, I shot directly at the pup, and it gave me a nice blurry background, although you get a sense, don't you, of where he lives. I'm not worried about getting a little sand on me, nor on my Olympus gear, because I clean mine off by pouring water bottles on some of the pro lenses and uh, the correct bodies. Not every Olympus lens, but I just hold it under a sink to rinse the sand off. But by getting down at this pup's eye level and even below and shooting up at him a little bit, I am bringing you into his world instead of us looking at it from our world, okay? So particularly if you're out shooting wildlife on vacation or kids or other things that are low to the ground, get down low. Don't be afraid to get down low. Who cares if you get dirty? I mean, do you want the picture? I don't worry about getting dirty. Buy, uh, buy, buy clothes for it, you know, buy the right kind of clothes for doing it. Now, let's talk about angles, okay? 
uh, when in Taos, we stayed at this wonderful bed and breakfast called Adobe and Pines Inn. I, I'm going to give you an example. This is the typical picture that a tourist takes of a sign straight on. And fortunately, there's some trees and there's some, you know, mixed lighting here, but that's kind of a boring shot. This shot with the arrow leads the eye down the sidewalk and gives you a little bit of sense of adventure of where I'm going. Let's look at the two. This is every sign you've seen shot taken by a tourist straight on, right? Snoozer, boring, um, just not, not doing it for me. Here now, suddenly, I feel like I'm going into the image. Here, I'm at a dead end. But here, I'm going on an adventure with my vacation. <gasps> then the next image you could show your family is of your room from a unique angle, right? So, no, I didn't add this guy, guys. I see that question. I never, you will never see a shot of mine where I add a new sky. Mm -mm. No, that's not me. I, I don't like that. Um, great question. No, I shot it. I had a spectacular sky naturally. You will never see an image of mine where a sky has been added that wasn't there at the moment. So good question, guys. Um, so as I'm going down the sidewalk here, you, you have a sense of adventure, like some place to go. Here, you have no place to go. You have an arrow pointing that direction, but you don't see where you could go. That's such a big difference uh, in terms of just basic signs and, and, and educating people on where they're going to go. I was uh, bef Before I picked my wife up at the airport in Albuquerque, I went wandering around uh, Old Town. And there was this car club had brought up some spectacular, oh my gosh, beautiful old cars. And I wanted to test. I love shooting into the sun. And one of the nice things about the H25 is it handles solar flare better than the 7 to 14 because it's not as bulbous by the very design. So this beautiful hood ornament, and you see how it produced multiple, that's no filter, that, that I didn't do anything other than shoot at F-16. If you want to sunburst in your image, you need to be at F-16 or smaller, okay, F-22, whatever, to create a starburst. And different lenses are going to do it differently. So got down low with this gorgeous hood ornament. And again, in, if I'd have shot it straight on, boring. There would have been clutter, distraction. But instead here, you're really taking in the beauty of this, this hood ornament. This is Big Bend National Park. And I see so many people try to shoot these ocotillas. This is a beautiful plant we have out here. They leaf out when it rains. They shed their leaves to, conf to uh, conserve moisture. Had this nice rainstorm in the back. But by getting up close and changing my angle, I was able to show you the habitat where this plant occurs. And sometimes you try to include a whole plant. We're using an angle. We're standing up looking straight on. Here, I actually held the branch at a certain angle, got up real close so that you could see the rain and the desert, the habitat, but see the water that produces these leaves, okay? So different, different angles will produce very different images for you. All right, let's talk about tip number two, and I cannot stress this is enough. As a landscape photographer, clouds are your best friend. Blue skies are generally extremely boring if all you have is blue sky. I, there's nothing that stresses me more when a client has hired me to do landscape photography, and I wake up early in the morning, look out, and there's not a cloud in the sky. You want to go... Can we just go back to bed or can we do wildlife or whatever? Now, yes, there's many other things you can do when you have a plain blue sky, but clouds are your best friend. So if you're driving on vacation, if you're flying, if you're at an amusement park and you have these great clouds, great sky, let the sky help carry the image. I was just doing a workshop here in Big Bend National Park with a group of folks, and this is called Muleers Peaks. So when you go to a when you go to a you know a unique place with uh, special features. Most people to photograph this drive to the overlook and they all shoot it from the same spot. Here we actually pulled off uh, in a very, very tight area, got out and waited. I waited for the clouds to allow this light. I kept saying, we'll talk about this later, be patient, be patient. And I watched the light travel across and eventually it lit up mule ears. But let me explain this. Without the clouds, there's no image with this special light. The clouds produce layers. They produce colors. Uh, tones, textures, clouds are your best friends. So when you're out on vacation, watch the sky. I can't tell you how often, if you're a photographer and you're on vacation, I have people go, oh no, it looks stormy. 
oh my gosh, are you, that's like, yes, you know, I'm ecstatic. Now, if you're going to Disney World, you tell the kids, look, kids, it's storming. You should stay in the room, but I'm going out photographing. Oh, but clouds are going to carry you. Here's that St. Francis Assisi Church. Look at what the clouds are doing in the background. And let me be clear, that is the natural sky that, that evening. There's no added sky to this image. But the black and white helps you see the tone, the texture. The, you feel the texture so much more by converting this to black and white. So, But the clouds, the storm, you have this sense. The dark clouds really help the, the, um, the cross stand out too. A client hired me to shoot some images along the coast of Texas for a home they were building. So technically, I was sort of on vacation. I mean, my life is kind of one big giant vacation, if you want me to be honest. A very hardworking vacation, but vacation. Now, I saw this line of clouds. I'm on his deck, uh, on, his, on his dock, I should say, down low. And I knew that there was going to be a period where the sun was below the clouds, casting color up on the clouds. It was going to be blocked by the clouds for a while. But once that sun cleared those clouds, I knew I was going to have an ungodly boring sky. So I knew to take advantage of the time. And then you see these crepuscular rays coming out as the cloud separates the light and, and the sun. Beautiful colors shining out there. I took advantage of the sky. No, I don't. I never use filters, um, Sean, to make a... Uh, a sky appear better. I'll use uh, polarizers and I'll talk about my filters at the end, but I don't ever use color enhancing filters. No. Here in Big Bend, driving along, clouds, storms. Look at the colors. Look at the look at the way the 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 rain is actually being bent from the wind. I mean, beautiful sky, and the foreground is okay. I mean, it's not the most exciting mountains you've ever seen. Those are part of the Christmas mountains on the north side of the park, but. That sky carries that image alone. I don't need a great foreground element. I have a spectacular sky, okay? So clouds are your best friend. But what do you do when you go out and you don't have much, many clouds? I don't include much sky. You see here, I emphasized the land over the sky. There's a couple little kind of pathetic clouds over here on the right. Chisos Mountains, that's a Rio Grande River there that separates the U.S. and uh, Mexico coming through the park, Hot Springs Canyon. So what I did was I framed tight on the land with a little, I'm sorry, tight on the sky with just a little bare strip of, of sky and then highlighted the foreground, okay? So when you don't have much, now, if you've got, Occasionally, you might want a big blue sky if you're out in the arid west or you're in an arid part of the country like Australia or something where you get that really vibrant blue, maybe even pop on a polarizer to make it pop a little more. But even then, I don't tend to you include much boring sky. In fact, there's days if I'm playing to do landscape photography and all I have is a blue sky, no, I change my plans. I just don't like to shoot that often. All right, let's talk about tip number three, chasing light. Okay, so I showed you Mueller Peaks earlier. This is the same day from a different position. And when I say we chase the light, I worked, I think, four or five different locations with the same group of people the same day because I knew with the way the storms were occurring that the light was going to change regularly. So we chased it. Now, we chased it in a relatively small area, maybe a two-mile by two-mile uh, square area, but you can see the rainbow beginning to form, which later became full and complete. But I, if you know the light is going to be spectacular, stay, chase it, go to where it is. Sometimes that might mean changing your plan, what you're doing on vacation, right? Um, we're going to talk about the different types of light we want to chase, front, side, back, harsh or direct, what to do when it's soft or overcast light, and low light, okay? So, Chasing light means having a good variety of apps on your phone that are going to tell you what the light is going to be doing. And that is often dictated by what are the clouds doing. Great radar apps, great, great storm apps will help guide what you want to be doing when you're out photographing. Okay. This is in Grand Teton National Park this past winter. It was only about minus 16 degrees at this point. You see the hoar frost, the horses in the background. This is front light. Front light is not when the light is hitting me on the front. It's when the sun is at a low angle behind us falling on our subject. 
This is one of the easiest scenes to expose for. It's where your camera is probably the smartest if you're relying completely on the meter. I learned on a broken Canon AE-1 when I was 16 exposure, so I shoot manual 100% of the time. I'm not saying that's the best. I'm saying that's how I learned, so that's all I've ever done. So that is front light. Front light can produce some beautiful colors, beautiful situations. The key thing that can trip you up on your vacation photos is watch out for your shadow creeping into your image or your tripod uh, shadow. Sometimes you got to work a little bit of an angle off to the side to keep your shadow or use your framing if you got a zoom lens. Okay. Side light. Um, up in Glacier National Park last month where it was beastly warm for up there in the, in the mid-90s, we kept waiting at this one lake for this cow moose to come out and forge. She did. Came right up close to us, forging, looking right at us. And here you see this nice side light. Side light can produce some beautiful images, but it can also produce an exposure challenge for you. You don't want to blow out the highlights. You don't want to have... Well, sometimes you want no, no detail in the shadow. So you have to choose and balance what, what it is that's important in that image. Here, I love the side light. You see all the mosquitoes. Oh, dear Lord, that poor moose. Um, you see all the mosquitoes that are backlit there or side lit that are showing up in the image. Backlight. Okay, guys, here's a quiz. Somebody's going to know what this is. If you see all these highlights, these uh, specular highlights in this image, who knows what that is called? That is a that is a weather phenomenon, and I'm curious if anybody knows what that's called. And I'll get I'll give you a sec to figure it out. This is Grand Teton, and I'll give you a hint. It requires extremely cold conditions. It was about minus twenty at this point, and this is backlight. Backlight. Ooh, I don't know if y'all can hear the thunder. If I lose y'all, if I disappear, it means lightning has cut off power, cut off the internet, or something. Because we do have a storm kicking up, raining pretty hard out there right now. So backlit can produce some, uh, you're right, that is hoar frost on the trees. But what is the, what are the little circular specular highlights that are uh, falling? It's not snow, okay? Yeah, there's hoar frost on the trees. But if you see this little specular highlights all throughout, okay? Uh, I'll give you diamond dust. So what happens is when it's that cold and clear, you get these crystals falling and it literally looks like the sky has diamonds falling all over it. And it is unbelievable. And I knew I wanted to capture that. And the backlit is what you, you had to have backlight so that it would shine off of it. Front light wouldn't really show it as well. So backlight, you see these, somebody pointed out there's crepuscular rays coming through. No, that's not on the sensor. Mm -mm. Let me, let me be clear about Olympus sensors. Let me say this right now. I have used my Olympus gear for almost two and a half, three years. No, no, April. So, so a little over two years. I have never cleaned a sensor. Let me say that again. And I am, I change gear in the desert, in snow, in ice. I've never had to clean my sensor. They are unbelievable in that sense. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm saying I've never had a sensor spot. Yeah, on my lens, I've had to clean my lens, of course. Never had a sensor spot. It is mind-boggling how they accomplish this. Backlight can be challenging to a novice photographer to expose it correctly. But with Olympus mirrorless cameras, with what you see is what you get with your live histogram, live highlight alerts, you can control what's going to happen in the image. It makes it so much easier. So I like that since 2005. Never cleaned an Olympus sensor. Yeah, me beat Randy. Nice. This is this is the kind of moment you live for on vacation. This is where you tell the family, I'm ready to go. You go, it's diamond dust. Just just stay there. Not that you got a lot of family members at minus 20 outside, but hey, maybe so. But what you want to do is when you have a backlit scenario, it can produce this beautiful rim lighting effect, okay? So your kids at, at Disney World, you can get this beautiful rim lighting, maybe around Mickey's ears on their head. You know, you're not shooting them straight on, maybe. Maybe you're shooting them at an angle, but you're going to get this nice rim light effect. And we want to open up a little bit so that their face isn't too dark. But backlight is not something to run from, even though it can be a more challenging exposure situation. What do you do when you have harsh direct light when you have the sun up high? Number one is I often think in terms of black and white. Now, I had some great clouds. And you see what that produced, these beautiful shadows. This is Great Sand Dunes National Park. So 
a lot of times, particularly out west, guys, don't be afraid to shoot midday, but often think black and white because black and white communicates texture, tone, emotion, often way better than color ever can. So here you feel the sand dunes in, in the national park. You, 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 it's almost like you can feel that sand between your toes. Took advantage of clouds. They were my best friend. The harsh direct light meant in color, this is a fairly boring image. It has some really strong blues, some whites, and some browns. But in black and white, this was one of my favorite images from, from that day in the park. What do you do in overcast light? Listen, this is very important. You can shoot all day easy. You notice there's no shadows. This is a, a Rocky Mountain Bighorn Sheep and Glacier from last month. Uh, he's molten, getting rid of his winter coat, going into his summer but you notice because it's soft, there's no harsh shadows being being cast by his horn onto his face. Often, if you've got if you've got front light, you'll have a shadow on his eye or on his face from his horn. But here, none. Beautiful. I love overcast light. I you can shoot all day and not have to worry about shadows or raccoon eyes on people. It's spectacular. Don't be afraid of an all cloudy, socked in day. Uh, sometimes those boring gray. Winter days, well, don't shoot the sky, but shoot everything else because you have this beautiful, soft light. And, and if you think about, well, that means slower shutter speeds, whatever, it's okay. You're using Olympus, man. The image stabilization is your friend. It's going to be your savior. What do you do in low light? Well, that's when I put it on a tripod. And this is a very long exposure. I think this is like two seconds long. And got this beautiful fall foliage here in, in southwest Colorado. You see the clouds are moving a little bit. The, the water's blurred a little bit. And low light is a spot where you might go, oh, maybe I can't handhold, but maybe you have a tripod. And if you don't, maybe you lean up against a tree or you push the camera into a railing. Whatever it is, low light can be a spectacular time. Here's a tip for those of you that are traveling, and sometimes you have non-photography family with you. If they like to sleep in, great. Get up early, go shoot, come back, go, go, you know, go shoot low light, even come back, go have breakfast when they finally rouse themselves out of bed, go do the thing, you know, and then go back out later in the evening and shoot nice low light because low light can produce some spectacular images. Okay. What if you have to create your own light? There's two types of flashlight. You can create light by using a flash, okay? Or you can actually use a real flashlight. This was on our Amazon Riverboat Photography Workshop, and this is a client. And I look back, and it was completely black. I, I didn't have a flashlight on him. But I saw the boat driver's uh, head, the sunset going down. We had done a sunset uh, ride out on a little skiff on one of the tributaries, the Amazon. And I pictured this image in my mind, and I immediately asked one of the clients, would you hold this flashlight, not a flash, but a flashlight at this angle to cast sideways across? I didn't want to shine directly on. That would have been boring. It would have flattened his face. But by putting it off to the side, it would create some dimension, some texture. I knew I could balance the image with the sunset. I could have the boat captain in silhouette and a little light coming across there. And because of Olympus's image stabilization, I was able to handhold this shot even though we're on a moving boat and get a great shot of this. Uh, I don't shoot people a ton. Uh, maybe I should say I, sh I don't photograph people a ton in today's world. you got to be careful. And uh, But this was one of my favorite images from that Amazon trip. So let's talk about how to choose the right lens. Which lens length is best for the shot? I I'm going to confess something about when I was a fairly beginning photographer for a long time. In my mind... Anytime I came up on a grandiose, majestic, giant, beautiful, awe-inspiring scene, my inclination was grab the wide-angle lens, okay? But here's the problem with the wide-angle lens a lot. If you think about it, when we go super wide, you know, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 millimeters or, or lower, okay? We make everything in the image smaller. We actually push it away from us. And I know you know what I mean because what happens is you come back and you have this image of this grand scene and you show it to someone else. They go, oh, yeah. It's because you pushed everything. Well, you took these giant mountains in front of you and you made them little bitty. So here's one of my favorite tips of the day. Are you ready for this? Whenever you are looking at a scene and trying to assess 
what camera lens, I'm sorry, what, what lens you should use for the scene, your eyesight is generally a 50 millimeter lens. Okay. That's why it's called the standard lens, the normal lens, right? 50 millimeters like our eyes. So if what you want on your image is smaller than your eyesight, then you need a focal length that is longer than 50 millimeters. I'm going to tell you one of my favorite landscape lenses is the 40 to 150. I would say I use this probably as much as the 12 to 40, and I'll probably use it almost as much as the 8 to 25. But this is one of my favorite landscape lenses, particularly in a place like Big Ben. Because so many of the scenes, I, I don't want to push them away and make them smaller. I simply want to pull the viewer into the image. I want to take, listen, well, for those of us who get to travel a lot, we're very blessed. You know, much of the world can't sit around and think about where they're going to go photograph next. They're too busy trying to figure out what route they're going to eat for their next meal so they don't die. So let's think about how fortunate and blessed we are to get to go out and think about these kind of things. So you have this grand scene. I want to take someone who wasn't privileged or blessed like me to get to go there. And I want to feel like they are standing there with me looking at it. And by choosing the proper focal length, I can increase my ability to do that. So... Here is a uh, scene from Yellowstone, Lamar Valley, and the wind was whipping at high elevation, not where we were. It was sunny and on us, but up here at this high elevation, the wind was whipping and blowing the snow across these trees. So that was a very small part of my eyesight, and I knew I probably needed to be around 200 millimeters for that shot or longer, excuse me. So I grabbed a long telephoto lens, took the image, and now you feel like you're in that blowing snow. The wide angle shots, there's no blowing snow right in front of me, and you feel like that snow is blowing way over there, not anywhere near you. Here, you feel like, oh my gosh, what an adventure, right? So here's another scene from uh, uh, southwestern Colorado during fall foliage. I looked at the scene, and what I wanted in the image was basically like my eyesight. So I pull out and shoot at 50 millimeters, right? And the beauty of that is, um, you know, you got a couple of different lenses in the, in the lineup. Uh, it's multiple, more than two lenses that'll do that. So again, use your eyesight. If, if, if what I can see corner to corner is what I want in the image, then you know you want to be around 50 millimeters. And I will tell you, as a beginning photographer, I didn't even understand why they made lenses like, like in the 24 to 70 millimeter range. Who would shoot that? That's what I shoot more now than even wider. I mean, I love that focal length for landscape. Now, once a year at the Fort Davis uh, National Historic Site right here near the town where I live, I'm outside of town, but in town, once a year they do a lantern tour. Now, sometimes your vacation images can be in the very town you live, parades, museums, whatever it might be, all kinds of cool stuff going on. And a friend of mine, Matt Walters, this great historian, and they do this lantern tour and they do skits all around the fort, okay? And I like to go right at dusk so that I know I'm going to get some great photographic opportunities. And I asked Matt at the end of the tour if he would hold the lantern near his, this gorgeous belt buckle because I wanted to capture the belt buckle with the light of the lantern. And I knew that I need to be wide because I was so close to him, I couldn't see the whole, even though, even though that, that looks small, I'm, I'm shooting so close, I knew I need to be wide, so I'm at 24 millimeters. It was, it was double what I could see. I had to turn my head like this, so I knew it needed to be much wider. Now, every now and then we can go mega wide when the scenario allows us. Here, I'm on an unpaved road near Telluride, Colorado. Fall foliage, great skies. And I pulled out the big eight millimeter, you know, fisheye lens because I want to capture this big, majestic scene. The canyon, the mountain, the clouds. I had a lot going for me. So here I went ultra wide. I feel like the viewer still feels like they're in this scene because they feel like they're standing at the head of the canyon. So I'm also using, using leading lines that we'll talk about in a minute. Bosque del Apache, New Mexico. Um, yes, yeah, Skip, you're right. When I say 50 millimeter, I mean effective focal length, guys. Okay, so yeah, sorry about that. The, the, the focal length I have posted here, so you're right, because our eyesight sees at 50 millimeters, that means on our Olympus bodies, we'd have to be at 25, okay? That's a thanks, Skip. Great clarification. 
Yep, 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 yep. That's right. I am talking about a, a 35 millimeter equivalent. Thanks, guys. Good, good clarification. Good catch, guys. I appreciate that. Um, so, yeah, wh whenever I'm showing you a focal length in this section, I'm talking about effective. So if it says 100, that means you're shooting with a 50. Okay. Great point, guys. Great point. I love going to Bosque del Apache, do, do several workshops over there. And so often we always think about pulling out our longest lens to get in tight on one bird. But Bosque provides spectacular environment shots every day. Okay. Every day. So here I pull out the 160 millimeter, 80 millimeter lens. And I know I want silhouettes, so I know I have to have a very fast shutter speed. But but it but by going in tighter, you get these birds, you get the reflection of the birds in the water, not the birds that are flying. Obviously, those are birds standing in the water. You get the sun, the reflection of the sun, some clouds working. I love the visual balance of this image. Lots of great leading lines drawing your eyes here and there. So, yes, this is one where you want to go longer and create a beautiful environmental image. Now, I talked about chasing light and how the light changes. So the first image you saw of mule ears was from a ways up the road, and I waited for the light to get right on mule ears. Then you saw a second image as we got a little closer. Now we have a full rainbow developing, okay? Full rainbow developing. And I had to go with a panoramic because I didn't have a single lens that would capture this whole scene. The 8 millimeter wasn't wide enough, and I, I also wanted to do more with my foreground. So I shot a two-row uh, panoramic and stitched them together. Guys, you don't need to be afraid. A lot of people think you. A, a lot of people think that that panoramics are very complicated. You need expensive equipment, hogwash. I shoot them handheld, long lens, no expensive nodal point. I do have a good technique to do it. Uh, if you want to learn, come out here and join me on one of my workshops, or maybe I can do it uh, at home with Olympus Pano long lens panoramic. Uh, presentation one time. I'd love to do that. So here's a great panoramic stitched and, and it shows you this gorgeous, this storm on the right, the rainbow on the left, mule ears in the center. Okay. Tip number five, be patient. Nature and people are constantly in flux. And if you will wait for that moment, it will pay off. I am by nature, not a patient man, but Many years ago, I got I decided to get into macro photography, and I had to learn patience big time. And it's been one of the greatest things that ever happened for me. I, I recently had a client on a bird photography tour who also did trail running. And at one point, I'd look at his wife and tell him, he does understand that photography and trail running really don't go together. Um, it Patience is key. It, this is a scene. These are mountains, the Sierra del Carmen's in Mexico across the river here in Big Ben. And I knew that as the sun came up, once it got above this bank of clouds, there wasn't going to be a whole lot of color. But I knew that at the right time, if my client would be patient, that the sun would stream across the edge of these mountains, producing really nice rays. And I just said, just wait, because it was kind of boring for a while. Well, do you think we should? I said, no, I don't think we should go anywhere. I think you should plant your rear right here. You hired me for a reason. Just sit, because we have a window when we're going to have some really nice light. And I want you to capture that. If we get in the car, we might miss it. And we've got this really nice mountain in front of us where it's going to split the further down. The, the mountains aren't as uh, don't have the shape and it doesn't split the sun the same. So patience can pay off. I would rather go home from a vacation with a hundred spectacular images than 5,000 crappy images. Okay. This is one of my favorite spots for sunset in Big Bend. It's Soto Vista Overlook. And as the, the clouds are moving relatively quickly, and this is Kit Mountain out in front of us, and a client was asking me some questions, and I saw where the light was coming. I said, and she started asking the question. I go, just shoot, just shoot. You're going to have this light for about a minute and a half or so. And so we started shooting. We'd been waiting for an hour to see what the light was going to do. And I mean, for a minute and a half, it was bam, 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 bam. Take panoramics, take, take wide angle. I had three cameras on three different tripods, all going, going, going. Actually, I had two cameras on a, on a black rapid strap and one on a tripod. Shot for like solid for a minute and a half. And she got done. She went, oh, I see what you mean. Because by then, the light had moved off the mountain into the flats. And it was no longer a spectacular an image. 
But by being patient and waiting it out at this one spot, so many people, they just drive and they hit every single highlight in a park. And I know it's fun to see it all. Maybe you only have one day, but sometimes being patient and teaching others to be patient will help you have a moment that will last a lifetime. This is a big horn ram here in uh, Yellowstone in the Lamar Valley. And the light had been overcast and soft for a while. And when we, when we first saw this uh, ram, there probably were 30 or 40 photographers. And after about 45 minutes of waiting for the light to do something, most everybody else had gone. We still had our group. And, I mean, all of a sudden there's a hole in the clouds and the light comes out and hits it. Got you, the, the colors on the rocks get really warm. The colors on the ram pop. And all because we waited. We could have we snapped some in the overcast light, but it really made a difference with the warm tones in this image to just be patient. Oh, and he'd been lying down. So people shot, shot, but eventually he's going to get up and forage a little bit. Uh, I was out in my friend's boat. This is the, the client who hired me to uh, shoot uh, for his home. And I saw a shrimp boat off in the distance. And I knew what the sun was getting ready to do. And he said, do you want me to move? I said, no, no, no. I need you to keep the boat right here. So he had to keep making some adjustments. And I said, I'm waiting for the ship to get where I want it. I'm not going to try to move to get where the ship is, uh, particularly when you're in another boat. And by waiting for the shrimping boat with all these goals fall along behind it, uh, I knew I'd get these beautiful you know, rays coming down, God rays, this reflection on the water and this nice highlight. And a lot of y'all are going to the beach in in uh, for for vacation man watch for moments to get beautiful this is backlit beautiful silhouette and a really lovely image i think uh, yellowstone this is a uh, dragon's mouth and the steam coming off and, and and the clouds it was constantly changing and when we got to this point on the trail a lot of my clients I'd been standing there for about a minute, minute and a half or so, and they kept moving on because the, when we first got there, you couldn't see the light. And I said, just just wait, just wait, just wait. And most of them decided to keep walking, and all of a sudden, the mist got thin. The sun's rays streamed across those trees. There were some buffalo off to the right that we'd been waiting to photograph, and I just knew if we were just patient and waited, we could really get a nice image here at this scene. Uh, out on our boat in the Galapagos one uh, one evening while we're the sun's setting. In terms of being patient, sometimes that patience means making the most minor adjustments. So I love shooting into the sun and I love starbursts. Okay. So sometimes I get the starburst, particularly in a scene like this, you know, the this it can look very boring. If if you moved your head a couple of millimeters left or right or a centimeter or so, you might put the sun behind a cloud and it's not that cool an image. But if you're looking through your viewfinder, right? If you're looking through your viewfinder at the sun and you have it at F16 or smaller to get a starburst, you can actually see the starburst by just moving your camera ever so slightly. And as you can get the sun to pop out, just start firing away. Listen, don't be camera shy. Don't take three images and think you got it. Take 100, take 200 to make sure you get it. So as I'm moving just ever so slightly, get that sun to pop out, bam, 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 bam. I just keep shooting because... It might be that you move a millimeter left, right, or a centimeter left or right, and it makes all the difference in the image. So by being patient, I got beautiful God rays coming down through the clouds. And if some people might walk up and the sun's behind a cloud, no, oh, gosh. But no, 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 no. Be patient. Let it get to the edge. Move your head ever so slightly with your camera to get that sun right on the edge and produce this really nice starburst coming out. Tip number six, take your camera everywhere. Every location can offer you some spectacular photographic opportunities, okay? So this is uh, one Christmas. My wife and I, there's a, a little town near called Marathon, Texas. Yes, Marathon, Texas, not Marathon. Thank you. It's Marathon. And we went there for Christmas, and there's this beautiful historic hotel right on the railroad called The Gage. Beautiful decorations. There's this lovely couple sitting on the couch. And, uh, I mean, just a beautiful scene for the holidays, particularly if you're traveling at holidays, window shopping for a photographer is completely different than for a non-photographer, particularly at the holidays, right? So take your camera because you never know what scene might pop up and give you spectacular opportunities. We went walking around town in Alpine, which is near Marathon, and here's this great store, you know, this retro vintage store called the Dime Store Cowgirl. Beautiful different colored lights behind it, and I think it made a real lovely image right here. 
Again, you're going to the beach. Angles, get down low. What focal length? I went wide, eight millimeter here. Got beautiful light, for, front light landing on this whelk shell. You got the dock going out there to the left, the fishing dock, some clouds over the ocean. But I want to give you the habitat that this whelk shell was in, right? What, where, where does this thing live? <clears throat> oh, so you know what? And when I go to the beach, I don't lay out on the beach. I'm Scottish. Like I go from white to red. I'm white with freckles or I'm red with freckles. I'm never tanned with freckles, right? So when you go to the beach, take your camera because that's all I'm doing. I'm photographing, right? Um, great spot to photograph on vacation. Here's a bookstore in Marfa, Texas. And I had to have my camera with me. And normally I'm just going to this bookstore to see if there's any books that I just have to have. And the light was streaming through the windows. This is at the St. George Hotel. Beautiful light reflecting across and, and light there in the, in, the, in the fixtures above. I normally would be the last guy to ever photograph in a bookstore. But I love the, the – this is a bookstore that just – Feels like I need to go sit in it for a while just because of the light in this image. And I converted to black and white because I, I really wanted it to be all about the light and the mood. I didn't want it to be about the color of the books or the color of the floor or anything like that. I wanted it to be all about the mood of that scene. Okay. There's a restaurant. Uh, when we do our Costa Rica photography workshop, there's a restaurant with a deck. And they feed hummers and they have flowers out. And so these hummers are used to people. This is taken with a wide angle lens. I, I, the, the Hummers are so used to people, you can put your camera out there a little bit. And this is one thing I love about your Olympus. You know, it's so light and easy to do. Even the EM1X compared to all your full frame heavy gear, you know, bam, 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 bam. I'm just taking shots. Uh, you know, I, I put the image on the back, the live view there on the back monitor, LCD monitor. And boom, 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 boom. I'm firing away. Because this bird is habituated. It's not going to fly off. It's used to people being close. So that's at a restaurant. We went to go eat and bam, great images of hummingbirds. Oh my gosh. Shooting for that client on the coast. I, I am not a portrait photographer. I don't know how to pose people. I, I, I absolutely despise posed images. But there was this precious little boy out in the surf casting this fake toy. Now, clearly, you don't just shoot random kids at the beach. Creepy. So I saw him with his family and I said, listen, I'm a photographer. I'm working for a client. May I have your permission? Because this is absolutely adorable. And they gave it to me. So, you know, I took advantage of this spectacular, just uh, candid moment. And we're going to talk about candids, but what a great memory to relive telling people the story about this kid cast. And, you know, he would try to cast his lure would fall out behind him and he'd cast. He didn't care. He was having a blast. Let's talk about tip number seven, follow your eye. Composition is where so much of the creative aspect of photography can flow out of who you are. And there are what we call rules of composition. And then sometimes you break the rules, but you got to learn to follow your eye. Your eye will teach you why an image is good. And so here's an assignment. Whenever you're looking at Instagram, whenever you're looking at Facebook or whatever other social media or a, an actual book of images, I want you to start asking yourself this question. When you come to an image that just really captures you, I want you to ask why and where does your eye go in the image? A great photograph dictates how the eye traverses through the image. Okay. So here I'm at one, a great spot in Big Bend. I'm using the road. So your eye follows the road to the sun and then it goes to the right along the mountains. So there's a pattern there. There's leading lines. The road guides you into that. And a lot of times landscape photographers, we try to avoid roads, but sometimes roads can really make an image, particularly when you're on vacation. Your friends aren't necessarily expecting images completely devoid of any of man's influences. Rather, show them what is spectacular about it, even with man's influences in the image. This is the uh, Adobe Pines bed and breakfast where we stayed there in Taos. And there was this beautiful walkway and the sun just happened to be at a right angle. Can you tell I like su uh, sunbursts here? And boy, I wanted you to be able to see that that sidewalk and these beautiful gardens the sun low in the in, in the beautiful ceiling above, the great colors on this Adobe bed and breakfast. Oh, my gosh. What, what a great place to stay. Now, that's an image that when you show somebody instead of just straight on, no starburst, improperly exposed, be like, wow, I want to go stay there. 
All right, here's something I, I wonder how many of y'all have tried, okay? This is a, let me make sure I get this right, a high-res tripod mode panoramic. I did not have, I couldn't use the live neutral density filter because I was in high-res mode. So I knew, though, the high-res mode would produce a bit of blur, also using a polarizer on this image. So this is, I believe, an eight-image vertical panoramic of a waterfall and glacier. So I stitched it all together. Turned out great. But high-res mode, panoramic, and your eye follows this waterfall back up, leading lines, you know, worked out really nice in terms of composition, very pleasing. But have you tried a high-res mode? Have you tried a high-res panoramic? I do high-res, long-lens, panoramic, multi-row, and you can get these humongous images that you could print that would cover an entire wall. Uh, the 50 megabyte, actually on the tripod mode, it's 80, 80 megabyte image. One thing when it comes to following your eye, when you're out and about, um, look all around you, okay? I was photographing uh, Grand Teton peak. We, we'd gotten out very early for the sun. Uh, for, I'm sorry, for the moon to set right above it. Standing outside five hours straight, minus 16 to minus 20 degrees. And I turned around, looked as the sun was coming up and the hoarfrost and the light was just beautiful this morning. Okay. So again, I, I actually walked to a spot so that you, I'm actually standing near a road in about two feet of snow. I, I didn't want the road to show. But I wanted this line of these trees backlit with this hoarfrost and this beautiful sky. And so sometimes following your eye, and, and if you saw the scene that we were shooting in front of us, you would, you would swear it couldn't have been on the same day in the same place. The light couldn't have been different. But follow your eye all around. Sometimes we have these phenomenal things in front of us, and we just get enraptured with it and never go, oh, oh look, there's a double rainbow back behind me. <laughs> That's right. Art Wolf does have a great saying about that. That is correct. A lot of times on vacation, you could be in places where you can use framing to your advantage. This is at a popular spot in uh, Glacier National Park for mountain goats. And so many people were moving off to the side to get the clear view, the clear shot without the trees. Well, I had these beautiful lichens on this rock back behind this mountain goat. And I do, I want to use the trees to frame it, to guide the eye. So guys, when you're on vacation, how often do you see an arch, a doorway, a window shooting through people's legs? People you know, or be careful about that. But, you know, trees or other natural or man-made items that you can use to frame a subject. Maybe at a restaurant, it's a line of, of or at a bar, maybe it's a line of glasses down the bar that you use to frame some shot. Whatever it might be, I think that if you can begin to realize every image doesn't have to have a clear view, sometimes framing can really help guide the eye to great images. Guide some clients up Guadalupe uh, Peak, the highest point in Texas, in Guadalupe Mountains National Park. And again, just on a hiking trail, but you notice the leading lines here on the hiking trail, but on the road down below. Okay. So ask yourself, what is your eye naturally following? Maybe you're at an amusement park. Maybe you're at a zoo. Maybe you're at a, the Mall of America in Minneapolis. Maybe you're out in the in, in a national park. What is your eye naturally following? What are natural eyeways, you might call them? How are your eyes traveling through a scene? And then try to replicate that in your images. Because here, in this image, you feel like you're on the trail with someone. Now, if there weren't this grand part off to the left, this would be a boring image to me. But but you get the sense of going up while the land goes away from you. Here, I actually use depth of field to control where the eye goes. And, and by focusing on a narrow part of the water, I, I feel like your eye starts right there with what's in focus. And then it follows the sun out and then you come back and maybe explore the beach. So you could also control where the eye goes by controlling your depth of field. Okay. Tip number eight, get off the beaten path. Some of the best images to be made are five feet to the left or five feet to the right. 
you don't always have to go eight miles down a trail to get off the beaten path. You can be in the midst of 50,000 people and still get off the beaten path. Trust me on this. Don't always follow the crowd. There's a popular spot in the Chisos Basin and Big Bend where I guide a lot. And there's these two overlooks. And you will see people lined up elbow to elbow right along this trail. And I often will have some clients and we'll get off the trail. Big Bend is a national park where you can walk anywhere you want in the national park as long as you can find your way back. <clears throat> and I will walk them off and go to this high point, go to a low point, And you'll see people looking over like, oh, huh. 100 people lined up for sunset over here. Nobody else is over with us. And we're not that far off the beaten path. We might be 20 yards. We might be 50 yards. We might be 100 yards. So just know that this is this is an unpaved road near Taos. Lightning was happening. And I told, I had Garant, the guy I hired to, to teach my wife uh, to photograph. I said, get me up here. And this is why I was so glad I had a local with me. I said, what if we got up here? He goes, no, you'll lose that. I said, perfect, great. Now there were gobs of people right back down along the river. There weren't a single other car up by us. Okay. Now, remember the shot that I showed you just a few minutes ago and I said you would not believe what it looked like in front of me? This was about an hour earlier with Grand Teton. That's the moon. You see a few stars left, some beautiful uh, wispy cloud there off of Grand Teton, the Snake River. This sometimes getting off the beaten path is being willing to go to a common spot when nobody else will go. Some of you have probably been at the Snake River Overlook when it was so crowded, you couldn't walk up to the front, right? This is at about, I would say, maybe 5.30, 6 in the morning. It was minus 16, minus 20. My beard was freezing to the back of my camera bodies from the condensation from my breath. Nobody came by for two, two and a half, three hours. And I cannot tell you what a magical experience that was. I always have this image to look at, but nothing can ever take it out of here because it was absolutely just breathtaking in every experience. The, the fog was constantly moving through and changing. The scene was so different over, over two and a half, three hours. Client was ecstatic. I was ecstatic. We were both very cold, even though we have great gear. I mean, it was cold, but, and there was no wind. So look at how still those trees are. I got off the beaten path at one of the most popular spots in one of the most popular national parks, didn't share that image with a single soul. Now, some of you might be saying, oh, there is no way that I'm getting off out at minus 16 or minus 20. You won't experience moments like this. You won't. It's worth it. Pay the price. Pay the price for the shot. That's what I say. Oh, my gosh. If you've never been to Roswell, New Mexico, and you want weird, just drive through. I'm, I'm not into aliens. I'm still looking for intelligent life right here among us. But but it's a cool spot. you got to go through. And when Olympus asked me to test the 825, I thought, hey, this would be a great spot. And there's this little statue of an alien where everybody sticks their little paid stickers on it when they leave the museum, the Roswell Museum. And I thought, oh, this will be really cool to roll the lens. And by rolling the lens, I mean zooming you know, in or out as you're taking the picture. So you want to have a slower shutter speed. And I just kept experimenting until I got one I really liked. So I think that's a, you know, that's a cool, that's so much better than just a straight shot of that stupid little alien with all the neon on it. Oh yeah, that's cool. This you go, you almost feel like the alien's coming for you. Now I believe in aliens. <laughs> I, I dropped my wife off in Albuquerque at the airport um, for her to fly back. And I decided to take a long drive home and just see what might happen. The, the mountain there is El Capitan at Guadalupe Mountain National Park. And in the back is Guadalupe Peak right behind it where I was going up uh, earlier uh, on another trip. And coming home, I ended up getting home about six hours later than I should have. I'd always wanted some images of lightning near El Capitan. And I notice as I'm back a little ways, storms starting up, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I was tired at this point. It been a long day. Had, had been stuck in Albuquerque an extra night, which was cool. Got to stay there with my wife a little bit. But I see what's going on. I come to this one spot, and I just set up, and, of course, live composite rocks. I don't know why anybody buys any other camera brands. Um, live composite just rocks. So I set up my camera. Now, I got off the beaten path. They used a different image in the promotion for this with the car headlights. That's at the overlook. I walked down the hill, 
because I didn't want vegetation right in front of me. I didn't want it moving right in front of the, the, the lens. So this was a slope. So I walked down slope, had to shoot above a fence and set up and must have captured 15, 20 images of lightning. Thank you, Olympus. Photographing lightning is so easy now. Because you can see how the clouds moved. The clouds on the right were moving quickly. The clouds on the left, low, were not. But captured multiple bolts. And I, I mean, I wasn't that tired driving home knowing I had these images, right? So what a spectacular moment. Uh, and, and two of the photographers came up. They stayed up at the top. They had no tripod. They clearly weren't had no luck. I stayed there until the rain got too heavy on me and I knew I was going to be chilled. Everybody else was gone. And I was like, Oh, what a great moment, man. Got off the beaten path. And this point off the beaten path was maybe 20 yards off the pavement. That's it. You feel like I've hiked out in the middle of nowhere and the road's just off to the right. See what I mean? I'm in the open area. See in this image, I walked down that open area to get down near the fence this is the image with the traffic coming by. You can see a little bolt of lightning there on the right. And that's a cool image too. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but that other image just really, in fact, Parks and Wildlife Magazine contacted me and I, I'm a contributor, but they said I hadn't sent anything in for that month. We want to use that shot. I thought, I bet you do because I love that shot. Capture candid moments. Stop posing people because odds are you and I don't know how to do it. Oh my gosh, if I have to look at another vacation image of what I call the death lineup, and this is the death lineup, you make all the family members stand in a line. Here's the only time, it's like a wedding album, and no offense to wedding photographers, but please stop taking these shots. God, I'm hiding, they're so boring. Here's what you do. Grandpa dies, and everybody pulls out the wedding album, and they look, I call it the death shot, because, oh yeah, there's Grandpa. Remember when he was alive? My God, that's what those shots are for. Oh, yeah, there they are. Oh, yeah. Oh, he's dead. My gosh, so boring. I mean, I, I don't even understand it. It's it's brutal. And odds are you don't know how to pose people well. So I was shooting on the beach. I knew where the moon was going to be uh, coming up. And I was hoping for fish, someone out fishing, someone. And here this couple walked out on this pier. I'm using a long lens. They don't even know their image is being taken. Zooming in nicely. And, and this is actually an interesting image to me of people, which uh, you have to be a really good photographer for me to really get excited about a lot of images of people. But let's face it, that's what you're on vacation for, right? Here's my wife. Uh, this is our, our uh, little room there at the uh, bed and breakfast. And, you know, rather than just have her stand up and look, she was busy unpacking. And I just said, Mel, so that she would just randomly look up at me and I took several shots. So I got her in a much more natural moment. You know, I wanted, you, I wanted to give an introduction to our room, the beautiful tile work outside. But my wife's one of those that if she sees I'm going to take a picture, suddenly she breaks into somebody that I don't know. So I love candid shots. That's what vacation is about. Those memories, those candid memories, not the lineup of people that in 40 years will, oh yeah, that's the one that just died. Took a friend of mine up Guadalupe Peak, um, just got him into Olympus cameras. And I said, come on out, man. We're going to go up. We're going to go on this trail. And I turned around, had this beautiful sunrise going on. And I, and I saw where he was standing in this nice warm light bouncing off the side of him. So I took some images of him. And I love how these turned out. Uh, <clears throat> you know what? M maybe you're on the beach again or, or wherever you're at. And I saw this young man, teenager, uh, fishing. And I saw this sun. Now, I did not know him, and I wasn't going to ask him to pose because I knew I wouldn't get a good image. But I, I, every time he caught something or had issues, he walked over to this picnic table where his family was. I decided to be patient, didn't want anybody to pose, and I just waited, and I waited, and I waited, and he started walking. I, and I already had my exposure set. I knew I wanted a silhouette, so super fast shutter speed. Bam, 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 bam. And this one with his stride, the pole out, this one was spectacular. This is printed now at like, two and a half, three feet uh, hanging in uh, my client's room. Really beautiful. I love how that image turned out. A friend and client of mine here in Big Ben doing a bird watching tour at Soto Vista. And I turned around and I saw this beautiful, the sun reflecting off the corner of his glasses. I could have asked him to turn around. It wasn't nearly the same shot. I captured him enjoying this beautiful sunset at the end of a spectacular day and got this beautiful color coming off his glasses. I couldn't have posed him well to save my life, but I love this image. Tip number 10, okay, guys? 
When you're on vacation, let the details tell a story. Who knows where I'm at? I've given you a few hints tonight. Who knows what I'm at? Let's see if anybody knows. I'll be really impressed if you know where I took this shot. I love this shot. I love the experience. Because the reality is, guys, small things can be very powerful. We don't always need 8 millimeter fisheye shots of this giant storm blowing up the sky. Sometimes walking into a store, and by the way, this is the Breaking Bad store in Old Town, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And uh, you see Walter and all the crew there in these uh, glass uh, vials, bottles here. And you, you get this feeling of a Breaking Bad story. So your Breaking Bad fans would love it. But notice my angle. I didn't take it straight on. Now your eye goes somewhere. <clears throat> Most of the time, you don't have a chance to get very close to wildlife. But every now and then, in campgrounds, picnic areas, places where animals are used to being near people. In Big Bend, if you come across a roadrunner out and about in the desert, he's probably moving on. But in the campgrounds, they get used to people. This particular roadrunner was on a side mirror of a car. Now, I kept trying to get my client to come over by me, but they were too busy photographing. And they captured a lot of images of this bird and the car. But I knew because this bird was focused on the other roadrunner in the, in the mirror and in the window, he was kept pecking at it and he would lose his balance and hop and then face me. And so as he, as he wasn't paying attention, I would just ease forward, ease forward. And this has been one of my most liked images of 2021 because people, I, I didn't know Roadrunners had eyelashes. Uh, most people would kill to have eyelash, eyelashes like this Roadrunner. Look at all the detail in the feathers. And this bird is perched on a car, but you have no idea of that because I let the details, I got up close because I had accommodating wildlife, didn't put the wildlife in any jeopardy. Listen, if roadrunners were four foot long, we'd all be toast. They'd be eating us. Uh, walking along a dock with all these shrimping boats, and I saw this beautiful old wheel that was attached to a door with this, you know, the, the, the four directional points on it. I thought, oh my gosh, I love that. I love the shadow. It was late in the evening. So I decided to take advantage of this and take this real nice black and white. I did for my client a big... Uh, what I did called it a shrimp boat study. All these time tonight, uh, I'm sorry, I know we're over, so I'm going to start wrapping up here. This black and white shot, and I have all these different images of this one boat. Rather than trying to get one big boat, I took details from the boat and created a beautiful collage. So maybe a collage of the details of something that you see on vacation that you can't capture very interesting, and it's whole, look at the parts sometimes. My wife, who's a coffee drinker, I can't even stand the smell of it, but I knew she was going to be pouring coffee, so I guided her how to pour her coffee well, and I said, okay, do this, get a nice smooth pour, did, took some shots, you know, our, our breakfast, different things. I, I own more mugs than any human being ever should, and I never use a mug because my wife loves teas and coffees, So, but I thought, here's actually an image of a mug I kind of like, so I got an image of a mug I like, right? <laughs> Here again, the details. What was she going to serve for breakfast? And the, the the scones were, oh my gosh, to die for. Great food at this place. But again, angles, right? And the details. By focusing on the breakfast board, you're getting to experience what I had. You could do this with a menu and a meal with all different kinds of things. Don't just, don't just take the documentary shot. Click. Yeah, there's my drink. No, 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 man. Play around. Give people a reason to look at the details. Maybe it's the way your drink is bubbling. So there's lots of different ways that you can capture the details and let it tell the story. So I'm, I'm come up across these old cars in Albuquerque and Old Town. And there's all these great guys. I mean, tats, you know, smoking, all this great stuff going on. And I asked this one guy. I knew he was very photogenic. And I said, I actually, I said, dude, I'm, I'm, I'm on assignment. Would you mind getting in your car? And I didn't notice the hat at first. Do you see that metal ring at the top? He pulls that down, flips his hat upside down. It holds his hat. I'm like, this dude I need some pictures of. And Drifters is the car club. I asked, I even told him, and I don't know how to pose people well, but I know how to do a few things. I said, put your elbow on the car, take your cigarette, and I'm allergic to smoke. I hate smoke, but I knew this was a key part of this image. So I'm sucking in smoke. I'm like, dude, I need you to hold your cigarette. I need you to blow some smoke out. Just do you. 
and took this shot, converted to black and white. One of my favorite shots of the whole trip. I love this shot. And I am not, a poor, I mean, I can't photograph people normally save my life. But when you capture the right thing, it, it, it does it for you. You don't have to be an expert when you can read. My eye was drawn to him without an image. My eye was drawn to this beautiful 51 Chevy Apache pickup. Ah, oh, what I wouldn't give to have one of those. Now, I hope that you've had a good time tonight, and I hope you've learned some things. Now what I'd love is maybe you could go on vacation with me. I'm going to be going to some really cool spots around the world coming up in 2022, 2021, and you might want to join me, like Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, Galapagos, Glacier, Yellowstone in winter. That wolf, oh my gosh, laying on my belly, having a wolf try, trot right at us was incredible. Night monkeys on the Amazon Riverboat Cruise. Um, I offer uh, um, international domestic trips through Wildside and Big Bend I cover with my company. So lots of great opportunities, guys. I'd love to have you follow me on social media. I, I've, I've made this promise, and I mean it, and not many people take it up on me. Follow me on one of these. You send me a question about Olympus or photography, I promise you it's going to get answered. It may take me a little bit. Normally, I often try to get to it right away, but I promise you, you will get answered. OK, as soon as I find it, the way Instagram and Facebook hides things sometimes drives me batty. But I want to help you. I love to help people. I love to teach. I hope that came through tonight. So I, I want to thank you. I'm sorry I went over a little bit and I hope you guys had a good evening. I know I did. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to hand it back uh, to Michelle and let her take over from here. I know I'm going to be around to answer questions for those who can linger. Haley, that was great. I, I think that was probably some of our best uh, feedback commentary I've ever seen in a presentation, ever. People loved your storytelling. I will say I heard you're a great storyteller like 20 different times through this. This is awesome. Cool. And shout out again to our comment section for helping the comment section on both YouTube and Facebook. I love seeing your guys' combined energies in there and helping people answer the questions. Uh, it's always helpful. You Makes know what? Why, why don't I go watch in my bag real quick? I saw a lot of questions about yeah, my bodies and, and my. Okay. I always have this on any trip. I have two EM1X bodies, always. I have my Mark III body, always. I will now be carrying on most wildlife and landscape trips the H25 F4, the 40 to 150 2.8, the 150 to 400. And those will be for sure in my bag every time. I probably will put the 30 millimeter macro. I have another bag for macro. This is a Mark III body with the 60 with my brand new MK diffuser. I love macro and I love Olympus has been my favorite because it's so light. I can handhold with one hand, get great sharp shots. I have the 12 to 40 2.8. I have one that I'll shoot on a different body. I have one in a camera trap out here for wildlife photography. I have 60 millimeter macro, 12 2.0 for night sky, and the 7 to 14. So those are my main bodies. I have a Mark II body that I use for underwater and camera trapping. So I use a lot of different equipment because I like a lot of different things. So that will hopefully help you. My camera straps are Black Rapid, the dual or the single sport, depending on what I want to photograph. I use a Think Tank Airport roller because it's incredible how much Olympus gear you can get in one bag and check on. So, I mean, uh, carry on. So those are my main, the gear that goes with me. So I do see a question that just popped up, but I, I remember one from the early, early on in the presentation. Hopefully that viewer is still with us. I'm not sure. Uh, they wanted to know how you did the statue uh, photograph with the clouds. Were you using like HDR or, you know, cause those are polarizer. Two very polarizer. All right. Polarizing yeah. filter. So spectacular clouds above us. That was the H25. Listen guys, I know, I know y'all think, well, he's a limps educator. We should go buy it. I need you to know I have bought every piece of gear I own except for I think one camera body and one lens that I've been given. So if you think I do this because I get free gear, that's nonsense. Yes, I get, I'll be honest, I get some discounts. I still pay for all my gear and I pay for it happily. It's worth every dollar. So 
The H25 is so sharp from edge to edge. And because you can use a screw on filter, I normally use wine country camera filter holder, the 100 millimeter system, but that's not always the most convenient. So, so I like using screw on uh, polarizing filters. I've used some brands. I just ordered some Nisi brands. I know Matt Seuss and Olympus educator has become a distributor for them. So I ordered from him and by adjusting my angle a little bit, you know, polarizers were great at 90 degree generally from the sun. The sun happened to be off to the right. So I was at almost perfect 90 degrees that made that sky pop. Plus I removed reflection off the, mm -hmm. off the statue. So this was what was weird. The, the photographer, by the way, if you go to Taos and you look for someone, Grant Smith is an awesome guy. He was, he was amazing in how well he did with my wife, because when I tried to teach a photographer, her and I are about to get a divorce. And they had a, she had a blast. It was wonderful. <laughs> so he took us to this, to this church. And for like five minutes, there was nobody in the courtyard. I'm like, so I'm shooting everything because they're off around the corner. Bam, 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 bam. And this statue, and I immediately saw these clouds, knelt down, shot up, love it. You know, you, it's almost like, you, like he's alive looking at you, right? Mm -hmm. So I, that is great because we were all kind of speculating in the comments, like, I don't know how he did it. Maybe it was HDR, maybe, yeah, I don't know. Olympus and then, and, and then everybody was like, well, he put in a sky. And I was like, I don't think Lee put in the sky. No, no, you will never, <laughs> I promise you, you will not see, I don't, if you like doing that, I don't care. Just to, just declare you do. I like picking up composites that people don't admit and picking on people, but you <laughs> won't see me um, um, ever replace a sky. I, I wouldn't feel for me, for me, I'm not judging bills. I would not feel accomplished in that. Um, I, I hope you have great photography composite skills and that's awesome, but I want to capture the sky because it's all about what's up in here too. So uh, we have a question from Karen. What's your favorite lens for night skies? Do you do any night sky stuff? Yes. Ooh, that's a great question. Probably the 12 to 40 2.8 right Good. now. Um, because it's versatile, I, I, I got over always shooting at the widest. I mean, my gosh, it was like I was infected. Got to go wide. Got to go wide. Yeah. But the 12 to 40 is so diverse, and it's great for doing a panoramic. Um, I, that's probably the one I pull out the most. I'll be honest. I haven't got to shoot as much night sky the last couple of years because birding is so busy in the spring. So I'm actually kind of cutting back on the birding so I can have more night sky stuff. <laughs> for myself and clients. It. I knew this was going to come up after we saw it. So I'm just going to ask it, was that a stock diffuser or was it custom made? Could you tell us about where you got your Yeah, the diffuser? MK diffuser, uh, go on Facebook uh, or do a Google search. There's not a lot out there. These are fairly new. The beauty of this is it disassembles and will be flat. It has a, look at that. This is for us gear dorks, <gasps> focus light on the side and a USB uh, kind of battery power supply. And he'll, you, you got to give him a measurement off your camera. He'll make it. I think it's 120 bucks. Look at MK Diffuser on Instagram, and you'll see why I ordered one. His light diffusing. We all know if you do macro, you can never buy a commercial diffuser that makes you happy. This is this is really nice. This is really good. And I see, I see. Do I use spot metering? Never. I I learned on a camera that had no meter. I can look at any situation and kind of know where exposure should be. You know, so if I see a white bird against a dark background, I need to be minus a third, minus two thirds of a stop. I just have that built in. So no, I, I don't, I don't want to have to change exposure. I use rear button focus. I don't, I don't even understand why we put auto focus on the shutter button. Like if you were starting to build a camera from scratch, who would do that? You'd be like, that's the dumbest idea ever. Because I want to go from shooting a bird in flight to a wide, to a long lens panoramic, I don't want to have to adjust a lot of things. So I shoot manual exposure 100% of the time. My autofocus mode varies. If you're using bird tracking software, here's something you need to know. It is working all the time. So if you're hiking with it on, it's burning battery because it's hunting for a bird. So what I do is your FN lever. I have the, I have a number one setting is single point larger, not the small one, the small, mm -hmm. the larger one, single point, just, just CAF plus MF. Okay. Continuous autofocus and manual folks. If I flip the switch to two, it is either the cross, the five point 
-hmm. or the nine point bird tracking. Mm. So whenever I'm done taking a picture of a bird, I just flip it. And now it's not when I'm hiking and it's swinging on my hip. I'm a thick Scot, so everything's bouncing off of me. It's not <laughs> hunting all the time, burning battery. So I just flip the switch. Boom, boom, boom. That actually brings me to another question. Are you, I, I know that you shoot mostly manual and I do the same thing. I'm, I, I'm notorious for not utilizing enough of my custom modes, but do you ever assign specific things to your custom modes on the top dial? Oh, oh my to gosh. Change? <laughs> In case you haven't picked it up, I'm a wee bit OCD and a bit of a control freak. I see my wife probably laughing off to the side. <laughs> Everything on my camera is customized. Very few buttons do what they were originally designed to do. So every camera has a C1 through C4 as programmed. So if I have an EM1X with an L bracket, that's a landscape lens. I mean, a landscape body. So C1 will be for general landscape settings. C2 will be for live neutral density filter. C3 is, I think, for uh, going right into high res modes, whatever. So mm -hmm. all of my modes on my my um, Mark III is for night sky. That's C1. C2 is macro without flash. C3 is macro with flash. So do I program them? Oh, my gosh. It's, I actually have a notes in my iPhone for what all of them are. So, <laughs> that was so about to be my next without question. An L bracket. <laughs> That's, I met a, a lady one time at an event and she had inside her camera hidden in the back behind here a little sticker with all of her <laughs> custom modes with what they were and I was like that is so That's smart brilliant. because my problem is, is I set my custom modes and the ones I don't use as often I can't remember what I put on that. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I just see Kathy Jean said, when using a gimbal head for wildlife, do you leave the image stabilization on? Yes, I do. I never turn it off. I get great sharp shots. I let all the Facebook keyboard warriors argue about all that crap. I just go <laughs> capture images. And by the way, I will tell you what I think is my favorite tripod so far with my Olympus gear. It's the Photo Pro E6L. This is what is beautiful, guys. It has a built-in leveling base. The look at this. Watch this. Oh, oh, this is so cool. This is so cool. I'm like a kid at Christmas. Right? I was gonna Watch say, this. I love how excited you are oh, about oh this. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I just started doing this the other day. So in a in a wildlife blind, do you ever get like that blind neck when you're leaning forward to shoot and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, I can't move, right? So here's the beauty of this. Watch this. There's this button. I tilt the gimbal head back, and now I just brought my camera towards me, and I'm not leaning into it. It's back to me. Oh, nice. That alone is so worth it, okay? Built-in leveling base. I use this for wildlife, night sky, okay. you name it. So, sorry, what brand did you say that was? I didn't hear that That is part. Photo Pro, uh, F-O-T-O-P-R-O. -O. That's the E6L. You cannot take the gimbal head off because of the built-in leveling base. You don't need to. It's carbon. It folds up small. It is brilliant design. I mean, I think it's probably the most brilliantly designed uh, tri tripod and gimbal head I've ever owned. And let me just say, I kind of have a thing for jackets, bags, tripods. I have a hard time getting rid of any of them. I did see somebody ask what kind of backpack you carry your gear in. And it's funny because I'm the same way. I have like four different backpacks and it changes depending on what kind of yeah. excursion yeah. I'm going on. <laughs> I, here's one thing I say about backpacks. I never will buy one unless I can get my hands on one and I need some new ones. I want one for macro. I want one for night sky and I want one for uh, sandy wet conditions. I've been researching the F-stop. There's a new Kickstarter bag out that kind of has me peaked, my curiosity peaked. But here's what I get so upset about. It is, I, I want a built-in water reservoir space because out here you have to be sipping water in a dry climate all the time. And I don't want to reach back for a water bottle. I have T-Rex arms. My width, I'm not, I haven't blocked a basketball shot my entire life, right? Unless it's a four-year-old. Damn, get out of here, kid. So... I don't reach back very far for things. If it's like behind me, forget it. So I like water reservoirs. Go look for camera, good quality camera backpacks 
with a water reservoir pack. It's very limited. And I will not buy it unless my hands have touched it and I've tried it on. And the, so there you go. Somebody in the yeah. comments, start a Kickstarter, make Lee a backpack, and then we'll feature you on the show, okay? Deal. Booyah. You've got it. <laughs> this is networking, people. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Lee, I don't know. Should we wrap it up? I know we went way over time tonight and I am so impressed yeah. with all of you guys that stuck with us and right. I appreciate it. And I saw so many comments that said, Lee, you didn't go over time. I wish you could talk more. Uh, it's oh, if amazing. you think I can talk, I can talk all night about photography. <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's right. what, take advantage of my social media, my website. I promise you, everybody at Olympus will tell you, I make these offers all the time, different kinds of offers. I will answer your questions, okay? I promise. If it takes me a week, if I'm out in the field, don't worry, it will get answered. That's awesome. Well, we super appreciated having you on the show tonight, and I can tell by the comment thank section, you. everybody appreciated having you on. And thank you. just thank you so, so much for your time tonight, Lee. I really, My pleasure. Really, it was great being here. I was very, very impressed with your storytelling. It was one of the most passionate uh, Home of the Olympus lives I think we've had so far. So it's been really I awesome like you, having man. you. Yes. Thank you. All right. Everyone that's still here with us, just like I said at the beginning, we're going to take a little break from Home with Olympus in August, but don't worry. We're still going to have a full day on August 19th for World Photography Day. We will have pretty much nonstop programming with all kinds of great educators like Lee. Uh, available and doing different topics. We're going to cover birds and night skies and custom modes and menus. We're going to cover a lot of stuff. So definitely circle your calendar August 19th. Come hang out with us. Uh, we're going to have a really great time. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you, guys.